Following two years of protracted negotiations, Indonesian Defense Minister Ramazard Ryakudu confirmed on July 26 that Indonesia will procure 11 Russian-made Su-35S flanker E multi-role fighter jets for the Indonesia Air Force TNIAU with the first aircraft slated for delivery in 2018. There will be 11 planes. After two years, it was finally finalized, the minister told reporters last week. The defense minister's SU-35 statement follows the Indonesian Air Force's recent announcement of the beginning of the second phase of its 2014-2019 upgrade plan. It remains unclear whether SU-35 contract has already been signed by Moscow and Jakarta. The minister's announcement was preceded by media reports that Indonesia and Russia have finally agreed to an offset obligation program including technology transfers in early July. Russia is expected to grant Indonesia a loan for the purchase of the military aircraft. The Indonesian Defense Ministry budgeted a total of $1.5 billion for the purchase of up to 16 new fighter jets. The Defense Minister neither revealed the price for the 11 Su-35s nor whether the contract contains an option to purchase five additional Su-35 fighter jets at a fixed price in the future. In June, Russian officials were optimistic that a final contract would be signed by the end of 2017. Prior consent has been reached on the contract to deliver SU-35 to Indonesia, it will be, signed, this year, Viktor Kladov, the director of Rostex International Cooperation and Regional Policy Department told reporters last month. Moscow and Jakarta have been in negotiations over a possible aircraft deal since late 2015. A joint military technical cooperation commission began talks in late in November 2015 in Jakarta to discuss details of the contract including technological transfers. Indonesian law stipulates that at least 35% of the aircraft's technology needs to be transferred to the country as part of the defense deal. The Su-35, NATO reporting name, Flankery, 4th++ generation, highly maneuverable multi-role fighter jets, powered by two 117S turbofan engines, and equipped with the Iribus E-passive electronically scanned array radar capable of tracking up to 30 targets simultaneously and purportedly able to engage up to 8. The Su-35 is the latest variant of Russia's flanker series. The TNIAU is already operating five Russian-made Su-27s and 11 Su-30 MK MK-2S. The Su-35 will replace US-made F-5EF Tiger to jet fighter jets, which had been in service with the TNIAU since the 1980s and were retired over the last years. By 2018, Indonesia's Air Force is slated to induct 10 more F-16 ABS fighter jets in addition to the 14 currently in service purchased from the United States under a $750 million excess defense articles contract. Jakarta is also funding 20% of development costs for the Korea Aerospace Industries KFX Next Generation Fighter.
visitor has a feeling, has a moment when they see an artifact, see an aircraft, or read about something, or when they tell their child, you know, the, the, their five-year-old child has a question, well, Dad, this airplane looks really, really neat. What did it do? Or, or Mommy, you know, that le airplane looks really fast, you know, and you have that moment where you see uh, a young child get, uh, get information, get excited. And who knows, maybe that child is going to be the engineer that has the next great breakthrough in, in aerospace. This is really what it's all about, is so that we can inspire our visitors and that we can preserve and tell the history of the U.S. Air Force. Most of the aircraft that are on display are either the only ones ever made or the only ones still remaining. Like in the case of the XB-70, there were two that were built, but one was involved in a mid-air crash and it was destroyed. Another example is the YF-12, this incredible Mach 3 interceptor that actually precedes the SR-71. It looks an awful lot like it. Well, one was destroyed uh, when the pilot had to eject. The second one burned on the ground and most of it was destroyed and what was left of it was used to make the prototype of the SR-71. And then there's the museum's example, the only one left. The NC-131 in-flight simulator, the NT-33 in-flight simulator, uh, those are unique aircraft. So as you go through that gallery, truly, this is the only place in the world to see these aircraft. It's wonderful. When visitors come into the Space Gallery, they can see more than 20 significant Air Force space vehicles uh, from representatives of all of the human space flight, all the human space flight programs, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, some shuttle equipment, and also um, the gigantic Titan IV space launch vehicle, and a lot of stuff in between. There are a few X-planes in there that do double duties as research aircraft, but they contributed to the space program as well. The X-15, the fastest thing ever is in there. Some very strangely shaped uh, X-24s that are very curious looking but have a very interesting story. And some formerly very, very secret reconnaissance satellites. And on top of all that, you will be able to see some balloon gondolas and learn what the heck do balloons have to do with space. And you can also see the Air Force airplane that caught the first satellite coming back from orbit. The Space Gallery is an important part of the Air Force overall story. And having this gallery and fitting it out with all these objects and exhibits and so on is part of our mission of preserving Air Force history, heritage, and culture and material culture. Uh, that's what we do, that's our stock and trade, and if we can preserve these stories and objects for future generations to appreciate and learn from, mission accomplished. In the Presidential Gallery, the visitors will be able to experience probably one of the most highly visible and important missions that the Air Force has. They are going to be able to walk through the history of presidential and executive airlift in a mostly chronological fashion, starting with President Roosevelt's uh, VC-54C Sacred Cow, all the way through the VC-137C or SAM-26000, which is President Kennedy's Air Force One. Since 1945, the Air Force has been responsible for the fast, reliable, and safe transportation of presidents and uh, other high-ranking public officials and elected peoples. So being able to show that to the public is, is really something that's unique to, to our museum and uh, something we're looking forward to doing. Visitors, when they come through the Global Reach Gallery, will be able to walk through three of the aircraft. So that'll uh, start with the C-82, and the visitors will be able to go up some stairs there and be able to go up into the cargo compartment. They'll be able to see kind of how the aircraft was structured, some of the accessories that go on within the cargo area. Then they'll also be able to go into our C-130 aircraft and uh, be able to go up the ramp um, as cargo would have into the aircraft, and they'll also be able to see some of the aircraft seats set up in that aircraft. The C-141 Hanoi taxi uh, will also be a walk-through aircraft. 
Visitors will be able to go up the ramp into the aircraft as, as in the others. The visitors will be able to go all the way up to the, uh, the forward bulkhead. They will be able to see the entire cargo area. They'll be able to see the restroom, be able to see some of the uh, signatures from crew members and POWs who have been on the aircraft. These are a lot of good stories about happy endings, about, about getting people support, about, uh, about getting people what they need or getting them to the place where they can get that help. Whether it be humanitarian stories about aeromedical evacuations, about bringing supplies to our warfighters that need them desperately, uh, or just moving supplies around the world. For decades, NATO has helped to preserve and create stability in Europe. The end of the Cold War marked a new period of optimism and hope. The Soviet Union dissolved peacefully, former adversaries joined NATO in the European Union, and Russia became a partner of the alliance. NATO's mission evolved. We worked to build a Europe whole, free, and at peace with Russia, while maintaining our defenses at the lowest possible level. We also stepped up to manage conflicts beyond our territory with missions in the Balkans and after 9-11 in Afghanistan. So NATO showed its adaptability at the end of the Cold War, and that was extremely important.
Today, the world is more dangerous than it's been for many decades. To the east, we see an assertive Russia, violating sovereign borders. To the south, we see turmoil across the Middle East and North Africa. And we face other threats, including acts of terrorism in our own streets. So today, our commitment to defend each other is as important as ever before, because the challenges we face are such that no nation can tackle them alone. And for many partners, that's a reason to seek NATO membership. For 67 years, NATO has bound the United States, Canada, and European allies together, an anchor for world security and the ultimate insurance policy. This myth ignores geography. Let's just take a quick look at the map. Russia's land border is just over 20,000 kilometers long. Of that, less than 1 16th, 12 15 kilometers, is with current NATO members. Russia shares land borders with 14 countries, and only five of them are NATO members. Outside NATO territory, the alliance only has a military presence in three places, Kosovo, Afghanistan, and off the Horn of Africa. All three operations are carried out with a UN mandate, and therefore carry the approval of Russia along with all the other Security Council members. In contrast, Russia has bases in three countries, Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine, without the consent of their governments. In fact, we've seen new permanent deployments all along Russia's western border with NATO allies, from the Barents to the Baltic Sea, and from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. There are currently an estimated 300,000 Russian troops based in its western military district alone. If you're interested in this issue, I would encourage everyone to read the NATO-Russia Founding Act very carefully. And I actually helped negotiate it. It says that NATO will refrain from additional permanent stationing of substantial combat forces. When we recently agreed to deploy four battalions to the east of our alliance, we also agreed that they would be rotational, not permanent. Moreover, the total levels are well below any reasonable definition of substantial combat forces. Russia, which pledged to, to exercise similar restraint, has increased the numbers of its troops along our borders, and it has breached agreements which allow for verification and military transparency. So NATO has respected its commitments faithfully. Russia has not. By signing the Finding Act, Russia pledged not to threaten or use force against NATO allies in any other state. It has broken this commitment with the illegal annexation of Crimea, the territory of a sovereign state. And Russia continues to support militants in eastern Ukraine. NATO's missile defense system is not directed against Russia. Geography and physics make it impossible for the NATO system to shoot down Russian intercontinental missiles. Their capabilities are too limited, their planned numbers are too few, and their locations are too far south to do so. And that includes the new site in Romania and the future site in Poland. Both Russian scientists and officials have confirmed this. Now, some claim that the agreement on Iran's nuclear program removes the need for NATO missile defense. But there are two reasons why they're wrong. The Iran agreement does not cover the proliferation of ballistic missile technology, which Iran is continuing to develop and test. And our missile defense is not about any one country, but about the proliferation threat more generally. A growing number of countries have obtained or are trying to obtain ballistic missile technology and NATO will fulfill its responsibility to defend its citizens. And let me add that we regret that Russia broke off talks on linking our missile defense systems against common threats. That was a real missed opportunity. We're not preparing for war with Russia. NATO is a defensive alliance whose purpose is to protect our member states. And we do not seek confrontation with Russia. For almost a quarter of a century, we worked to establish a partnership with Russia. We announce our military exercises well in advance, and they're subject to international observation. Our plans for more forces in the Baltic states and Poland are a response to a changed security environment. Remember that before Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea, we had no plans to send NATO troops to the eastern part of the alliance. And we continue a policy of strong defense combined with constructive dialogue with Russia to discuss our differences, to enhance military transparency, and to reduce risks. 
While practical cooperation remains suspended, we will continue our dialogue with Russia. NATO is claiming there has been a sharp rise in disinformation coming from Russia. The alliance has even set up a special website with 32 myths Russia apparently uses to discredit NATO. RT's Nikki Aaron takes a closer look. As the fake news mudslinging continues, a fresh pile of blame has been hurled at Russia. And what's causing NATO particular distress is something they're calling the spread of myths, which it says are being spread by this very channel. And so NATO has created their own reality check catalogue. 32 arguments, each intended at debunking fake claims which they say have been made about the alliance. Naturally, here at RT, we've studied the list in excruciating detail. Let's take a look at a few examples. So, NATO releases the ultimate myth debunking guide starring Russia. We took a look at them, and, well, honestly, most of those myths picture Moscow as this drama queen that's seeking to make everything about herself. But is Moscow really overreacting? For instance, the encircling thing. NATO says it hardly borders Russia. This is a NATO map. The yellow is Russia's border with NATO members. Myth debunked? Well, let's just take a small step back. Then there's another myth. For debunking, NATO turns to its decades-old 1949 founding treaty. Indeed, no mention of Russia, or rather, the Soviet Union there. It reads NATO is there to, quote, safeguard the freedom, common heritage and civilization. OK, NATO, if you say so. But what about all these? What we see is uh, a more assertive Russia. We cannot feel secure with such a Russia. Threats and challenges emanating from the... Uh, East. We are implementing the biggest reinforcement of our collective defense. And so this is a signal to Russia. And this is the message under one of the official videos from NATO drills in Europe. So NATO and Russia are good, or aren't they? We're confused. But let's look elsewhere. For instance, NATO's largest and seemingly never-ending operation in Afghanistan. The UN says that Afghan opium production is up 43%, so things are bad. NATO's response is the Afghan government's problem. OK, OK, at least there's no insurgents there. Not so fast. According to this report, the Afghan government controls only two-thirds of the country's territory. And there's also this. Well, so much for myth-busting NATO. Now, the vibes we're getting from NATO's idea of what constitutes the spreading of disinformation is anyone who queries NATO's vision and actions and dares to speak out about it in public. Talk about touchy. When you want to continue the politics of confrontation, you need an argumentation for that. You need an ideological hegemony for your positions. And this is a part of the NATO strategy of disinformation. And while we're on the whole fake news topic, let's address one specific example of disinformation given by the NATO spokesperson. It's regarding how in July last year, RT had issued a fake report about a fire at a NATO airbase in Turkey. Wow, that's a real egg-on-face moment, but fortunately not for us. Because we didn't say the fire was at the base, we said it was near it. News from Turkey where a massive forest fire has broken out near NATO's uh, base in the Izmir province. And while NATO said the fire was some distance from the base, there were also reports from local media sources that said the fire was spreading closer towards it. On our website, we gave all the information we had, including the statement from NATO. So it looks like it's not RT, but NATO that needs to try harder when it comes to getting the facts right. As NATO continues its biggest military buildup in Europe since the Second World War, more U.S. military hardware is being deployed to northern Germany. Dozens of military helicopters arrived in a German port on Sunday as a part of the alliance's ongoing mission, quote, to boost European security in the face of Russian assertiveness. NATO and uh, many of the NATO countries are trying to escalate uh, 
conflict with Russia. You have right now on the border of Russia 4,000 heavily armed U.S. troops uh, in Poland engaged in very actively in war exercises. You have three other NATO member states, Germany, Canada, and Great Britain, in the three Baltic states, about a thousand troops in each case. And we should never forget how much more money the U.S. and NATO spend on military than Russia. I think anyone could understand why uh, Russia would feel threatened.